welcome to Hannity. In just a few minutes, we'll check in with New King Rich Lore, Ingram, Monica Crowley, and Ainsley Earhart. But first, the House Intelligence Committee continues its ongoing investigation into whether Russia meddled in our presidential election. Earlier, President Trump, he called out the Clintons for their alleged ties to Russia. It's the story that the alt-left radical anti-Trump propaganda media will not be covering. But we will. And that is tonight's opening monologue. All right, so last night, President Trump, he took to Twitter and he wrote, quote, why isn't the House Intelligence Committee looking into the Bill and Hillary deal that allowed big uranium to go to Russia, Russian speech money to Bill, the Hillary Russian reset, praise of Russia by Hillary or Podesta, Russian and company, Trump Russia story is a hoax. Make America great again. Now, putting aside the embarrassing Russian reset strategy, the Hillary Clinton tried and failed to enact a Secretary of State. That's irrelevant right now. Tonight, I want to focus directly on what could be the single most damning connection between the Clintons and Russia. In other words, the rarely covered scandal. Ted Koppel probably didn't cover it. Now tonight, for weeks now, we've been telling you there is zero evidence of this eight-month-old media conspiracy narrative that President Trump and his campaign were secretly colluding with Putin and the Russians. Zero evidence. Now tonight, I want to focus on the real scandal that is rarely covered by this alt-left propaganda destroy Trump media, and it does involve the Clintons and an enormous mining company called Uranium One. Let me give you some background. Uranium One is a Canadian-based multinational operation. Now, they extract uranium, which of course is a key material that's used in nuclear weapons. They do it from Asia, Africa, and Australia. Now, Uranium One is responsible for one-fifth of all uranium production right here in the United States. Here's the backstory. Back in 2013, a company directly tied to the Russian government purchased Uranium One, a move, by the way, that was approved in part by Hillary Clinton's State Department. That's a very big deal. Now, this move allowed Russia and Vladimir Putin to control 20% of all uranium production right here in the United States. And you're thinking, that sounds weird, right? If you haven't heard this before, you're probably watching the mainstream media. And it gets a lot worse. In 2015, even the New York Times, they broke a bombshell report. The headline was, quote, cash flowed to Clinton Foundation amid Russian uranium deal. Now, according to the Times findings, Ian Telfer, who was the chairman of Uranium One, made huge, massive donations to the Clinton Foundation. Now, the Times writes, quote, as the Russians gradually assumed control of Uranium One in three separate transactions from 2009 to 2013, Canadian records show a massive flow of cash made its way to the Clinton Foundation. And while millions of dollars flowed into the Clinton Foundation from the chairman of Uranium One, the Times also reported that Bill Clinton racked up massive, huge speaking fees in Moscow. The Times writes, quote, shortly after the Russians announced their intention to require a majority stake in Uranium One, well, Mr. Clinton received $500,000 for a Moscow speech from a Russian investment bank with links to the Kremlin that was promoting Uranium One stock. Now, right here on this program, Clinton Cash, best-selling author Peter Schweitzer, he provided even more damning information into the Clinton connection to Uranium One. Remember, Putin and Russia, as a result of Hillary Clinton signing off, millions of dollars going to the Clinton Foundation and Bill Clinton, they got 20% of our uranium as a result of this deal. Watch Peter. The Uranium One deal is the see, greatest example where Vladimir Putin now has control of 20% of our uranium resources, which is insanity. And there was how much paid in that deal? When all of a sudden... Well, you have not... Yeah, Sean, you have nine individuals connected with this tiny uranium company that wants to be sold to the Russian government, which Hillary State Department signs off on, in addition to other government agencies. But no other government agency had a head who had nine individuals connected to that company that sent a combined $145 million to the Clinton Foundation. I mean, that is a massive conflict of That's interest. Unbelievable.
massive amount of money, they got a huge payback, and they now control 20% of America's uranium. Now, here's a big question. Why aren't the Democrats that have been pushing a theory that's false with no evidence for eight months, why aren't members of the alt-radical left destroy Trump media, why aren't they worried about what is the real alleged Russian association? They're so worried about Russia meddling in the election. Isn't this far more worthy of an investigation? I wouldn't hold your breath. Now, meanwhile, liberal lawmakers, they're now trying to impugn the character of the House Intelligence Committee chair. That's Devin Nunez. Now, last week, Democrats were outraged after the congressman announced that he had briefed the president on new information he had received that proved the Obama administration did, in fact, surveil President-elect Trump and his transition team. Now, on this program, Chairman Nunez said it was his duty to inform the president. Yesterday, Democrats up in arms because they learned that Nunez met his source on the White House grounds. All right, sounds nefarious. Not really. Congressman Nunez said he did it in order to be near a secure location where he could properly view the material provided by his source. But that's not good enough for liberal Democratic snowflake lawmakers. Many, like House Minority Leader Pelosi, they're now calling for Nunez to recuse himself, like Senator Snowflake Schumer are calling for him to be replaced. This is nuts. Watch this. If Speaker Ryan wants the House to have a credible investigation, he needs to replace Chairman Nunez. Chairman Nunez seems to be more of a partisan for the president than an impartial actor. He has not been cooperating like someone who was interested in getting to the unvarnished truth. Yeah, they don't care about the truth. Neither does the media. Now, Congressman Nunez, to his credit, he's not backing down. Here's what he said earlier today. Are you going to stay as chairman and run this investigation? Well, why would I not? You guys need to go ask them why they're, you know, why these things are being said. So can this chairman, investigation yeah. continue as you as chairman? Why would it not? Because are there's, there's, aren't I briefing you guys continuously? So but they're saying, you up and keeping so you up to words, speed. But I they're hear. saying that it cannot run as you as chair with well, you, you got to go talk to them. That sounds like their problem. I don't have you know my colleagues are perfectly fine. I mean there's they know we're doing an investigation and that will continue. And earlier today, Speaker Ryan was asked if Nunez should recuse himself. He said no. Congressman Nunez better be ready because the Democrats, they'll pull out every dirty trick out of their hat to impugn his character and his integrity. The real story the media won't tell you. That's what this is about. You want corruption? Look at the Hillary Clinton Foundation, the Clinton Family Foundation. Look at the money that went in Bill's pocket. And she had to sign off 20% of America's uranium going to Putin and Russia? Oh, I thought the media was concerned about this. Here with Reaction, author of the bestseller, Treason, Fox News contributor, former House Speaker, Newt Gingrich. Mr. Speaker, we got one donation, $31 million from this Canadian Frankie Estra, who went to uh, uh, Kazakhstan with Bill Clinton, and this was in the lead-up to the deal. And then also, when you look at the money that was given over a period of time, millions were donated to the Clinton Foundation, Bill gets twice his general speaking fee, and Hillary signed off on Russia getting 20% of America's uranium, which is used to make nuclear weapons. What are your thoughts? You know, well, look, I, I think it's very strange that both the House and Senate Intelligence Committees are chaired by Republicans, and yet all the noise is about phony charges involving Donald Trump. I mean, you have real evidence, as you pointed out. Peter Schweitzer's book is amazing. Since then, we've had all the WikiLeaks. We have an enormous amount of evidence. I mean, I do think it's legitimate for the American people to want to know about all this foreign money, uh, where is it going, who's it going to, etc. But I think a totally one-sided witch hunt by the elite media, uh, spurred on by liberals inside the permanent bureaucracy, uh, and then with the shrill partisanship of Schumer and Pelosi, neither of whom, to the best of my knowledge, ever called for an investigation of Bill Clinton's money, an investigation of Uranium One, an investigation of all the different dealings. Um, I, I think the country deserves a really thorough exploration of the issue of foreign money gradually corrupting our system, but that ought to be an even-handed, serious look, and it has to include as part of it really delving into the Clintons, 
and their network of millions and millions of dollars. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm frankly mystified why the Republican leadership in both the House and the Senate have been so timid and so unwilling uh, yeah, to that's just a open great up question. a straight-out investigation. Uh, it seems to me that's a quid pro quo. A Secretary of State signs off on letting Russia have ownership of 20% of our uranium? That is insanity to me. And if Donald Trump did it, I guarantee you that what is now an eight-month no-evidence conspiracy, oh. it would be Watergate time on steroids. Let me ask you this. We now learn from James Rosen and John Solomon and Sarah Carter, all investigative journalists for decades of experience, that in fact there was surveillance at Trump Tower. And it went on in November, December, and January, and it may have even happened before the election. Time will tell. Um, shouldn't that concern every American that there's surveillance and that probably the sitting president at the time, President Obama, and his closest aides knew exactly what was going on in Trump Tower and they didn't tell him? Well, look, I, I think this whole process should concern everybody. Uh, the use of the intelligence systems, the level of hostility to Trump, the number of, of, of uh, leaks which are felonies, uh, clearly illegal, the, the whole process by which the President Obama apparently, I mean, we ought to look at the decision memos. Who decided that they would, because remember, these, these are not hard, serious facts. They, they, they changed the rules so you could pick up the dumbest, weirdest gossip, and now you're going to distribute it to all the different agencies, knowing that making it that available almost guarantees it will leak. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's something, this was all done in early January after they lost the election. And there's a whole series of these kind of things where you have to believe that the deep state and the Obama team were in collusion yeah. doing things designed to undermine and weaken the person who the American people had elected to be president. But I, I think it's very troubling, mm -hmm. and I think it deserves very serious investigation. Let me ask you an important question, sure. though, about, about health care. I think this was mishandled from the start. In other words, nobody in the Congress got to see the bill that was being scored by the CBO. It, consensus was not built ahead of time. Rumors came out before the bill was released. People were vocal about expressing, I hope that's not in there, I hope that's not in there. Then a public civil war emerges on TV because there's such disagreement. All right, what's the right thing for them to do now? Because this was a major promise. They had eight years to do this. To me, I think it was rolled out in the worst way imaginable. I'm holding them accountable, like I promised. How can they fix us? Well, first of all, I just put on uh, uh, foxnews.com a fairly long outline of exactly what went wrong and exactly what we should now do, drawing on the lessons of Eisenhower, Reagan, Thatcher and what we did with the contract with America. I think that they, first of all, I think they should pick up immediately and work on infrastructure because it'll bring Democrats in to talk in a serious, practical way about working together. That opens the door to have Democrats talking about the tax bill. That sets the stage for a totally new approach to health care. Don't try to use Senate reconciliation. Don't try to get it through in a narrow. How do they get away way. with not using reconciliation? It's, it's, they're not going to get any Democrats to vote for it. You, look, if, if, if you and I are right, and then the President's right, and, and Paul Ryan's right, about how bad Obamacare is for rural America, then we should be able to do a better deal for North Dakota that is so vivid and so clear that Senator Heidekamp, who's up for re-election next year, has no choice. She either votes for it or she gets beaten next year. Now, I would, I'm happy to wait, if I have to, until right after we wipe out an entire wing of the Democratic Party to pass it in January or February of 2019. And that means but Claire McCaskill and Joe Manchin. What I'm not to do is write a bad bill. Mm -hmm. In other words, I'd put the bill up now. I'd fight over the bill every day from now to election. But if we can do better for rural America, the senator from Missouri has a real problem. The senator from Montana has a real problem. Uh, you can go down the list. There are eight or ten Democrats who are going to get wiped out All right, if they are seen as anti-health care. But that means 
House and Senate Republicans have got to focus on communication. This, yeah. this was as badly designed a process as I have seen. I think uh, the president was ill served here. You, I believe, having run a number of elections, yeah. that we are lucky that they did not vote last Friday because that bill wow. was at 17 percent, and they might well have lost the majority next year if they put their people out to walk the plank. All right, Mr. Speaker, always good to see you. We'll see you later this week as well. Thank you. And coming up, we're still calling on CBS News to release the full 45-plus minute sit-down I did with Ted Koppel just a few weeks ago. They only had 70 seconds. Laura Ingram weighs in next. Plus, Senator Sessions calling on sanctuary cities to abide by federal laws. Otherwise, they may get federal funding cut off. But some liberal mayors are vowing to resist. Also tonight, you can say one thing to your mom right now, what would it be? I'm really sorry I got arrested last night. <laughs> it's a, what did you get arrested for? <laughs> Smoking that dope, bro. Oh, great. Sorry I got arrested, Mom. We'll play part two of our series, Exposing Spring Break. You won't believe what these troubled kids are getting into. Ainsley Earhart joins us. And by the way, you may not want to give them the money next year. Straight ahead. Kennedy, so last night in this program, I told you how CBS News veteran Ted Koppel said I was, quote, bad for America. They only aired 70 seconds of what was like a 50-minute sit-down interview that was taped earlier this month. Well, this was not the first time that CBS has been called out for editing interviews. Now, back in September of 2012, after the Benghazi attack in Libya that killed four Americans, CBS sat down with President Obama the day after that attack. But when they first aired the interview, they didn't get into any details about Benghazi. Now, fast forward about a month during a debate with Mitt Romney while President Obama was challenged on whether or not he had called the Benghazi attack a terror attack from the very beginning. The president said he did. Romney said he did not. Three days later, CBS, they came to the rescue and they aired a previously unaired clip from their interview with the president where he said this. Watch. You're right that this is not a situation that was uh, exactly the same as what happened in Egypt. Uh, and uh, my suspicion is, is that there are folks involved in this who uh, were looking to target Americans from the start. It doesn't say it's a terror attack. It appears to back up the president's claim that he called it terrorism from day one, even though he really didn't. So why didn't CBS include that in their original reporting? Then, a few weeks later, right before the 2012 election, CBS quietly posted an extended clip of the Benghazi conversation on their website. Watch this. Mr. President, this morning uh, you went out of your way to avoid the use of the word terrorism in connection with the Libya attack. Right. Do you believe that this was a, a terrorist attack? Well, it's too early to know. Uh, exactly how this came about, what group uh, was involved, but obviously uh, it was an attack on Americans and uh, we are going to be working with the Libyan government to make sure that we bring these folks to justice uh, one way or the other. This has been described as a mob action, but there are reports that uh, they were very heavily armed uh, with grenades. Yeah. As, as that I said, doesn't sound like your normal demonstration. Right. As I said, we're, we're still investigating exactly what happened. I don't want to jump the gun on this. So why did CBS wait so long to put that out when it was part of a debate a month earlier? Were they trying to cover for the president? This is why we continue to demand that CBS News release the full interview that I had with Ted Koppel. What do they have to hide? Anyway, we reached out to the network today, but shockingly have not heard back. Joining us with Reaction, Editor-in-Chief of Life Z, nationally syndicated radio host, Fox News contributor, big smile on her face, Laura Ingram. <laughs> You've, you, we've dealt with this our whole lives. But they, in that particular case, they had the answer to a big question in a big debate. They wouldn't air it. Why? Yeah, well, uh, because it doesn't work with the CBS worldview. I mean, to... to play the entire, or at least a, a, a fairly edited, representative tape of your interview hurts, hurts the worldview of the left, which sadly, oftentimes, CBS amplifies and airs, which is that, you know, you do an aggressive show. You, you hold the left accountable. You hold conservatives accountable. Republicans. You've criticized yep. yeah, so do you. uh, Republicans. You, you, and you've, held, you've held George Bush accountable. You've talked about failures 
and, and communication and strategy and the current administration and the challenges that they face. And you're also a conservative. You're, you're, you're very candid that you're a conservative. The problem with CBS and, and so many other news organizations is that they will mask the fact that most of the people working for the network, most, not all, but most, are liberals. The way they choose stories, the way they produce stories, the way they choose not to cover certain stories is always going to be done through a more liberal perspective and a liberal lens. And, and you don't make any bones about the fact that you're a conservative. A totally different way to analyze the situation. But that doesn't, that, to, to make those more nuanced points, uh, that kind of blurs what CBS really wants to do here. They want to delegitimize you. They, the, the, uh, Ted Koppel, he's been up to this old trick, delegitimizing Fox. He's been up to this for years. He's been giving interviews about uh, how bad journalism today is for, really, for years and years. This is nothing new. You're just the most recent uh, victim of it. You know, it's just sad. Um the reason they're not going to release this, Laura, after the first question, I give a substantive answer. He goes, I'm right. not going to air that answer. I'm like, well, why am I sitting here? Do you want my real opinion or not? And, and yeah. all throughout the rest of the interview, I'm taunting him. Are you going to keep this in, Ted? Are you going to keep that in? Are you going to edit that out, Ted? Yeah. And it's like, of course, they're not, they don't want to air that part. So, you Sean, know. you know what you have to do next time? Yep. Next time, if you ever agree to do one of these interviews, you have to have your own crew Tape it. there videoing. And then you, you say, OK, we can, let's just both video it just for, just for fun. And then if they don't, and then you release the whole thing. That's, that, that has to be your ground rule. Yeah, going. You're right. Isn't that sad? My mistake. But it does. The same thing with phone interviews with people. You have to say, look, may I per permission to also tape this because yep. I just can't trust you to do a representative fair piece. And I would also add that uh, in 2015, Ted Koppel told Stephen Colbert that he does uh, oftentimes more serious studies on serious subjects than other media figures. Again, bemoaning <laughs> the fractured, na oh, fractured uh, nature of media. Yeah, that's right. what he said. I'm not holding my breath. All right, Laura, stay with us. We're going to keep you back for the next segment and coming up after the break. Countless Americans would be alive today and countless loved ones would not be grieving today if these policies of sanctuary cities were ended. The Attorney General Jeff Sessions calling on sanctuary cities to abide by federal law, but some Democratic mayors, they're vowing to resist. Laura Ingram, Monica Crowley, they'll react. Plus, President Trump signs a new executive order about energy independence. We get reaction from the EPA Administrator, Scott Pruitt. And part two of our series exposing how dangerous spring break is for your kids that you're paying for. That's all straight ahead with Ainsley Earhart. Every day to remove the gang members, drug dealers, and violent criminals from your communities, and we already are. Uh, they're being moved very quickly. In fact, General Kelly, as you know, has done a fantastic job on the border. Down 61% since inauguration, people coming in, down 61%, which is a tremendous number. Uh, my highest duty as president is the security of our people, the security of our nation. That was the president earlier today. He's vowing to end sanctuary cities to poor criminal illegal immigrants. Now, yesterday, Attorney General Jeff Sessions addressed this issue. Watch this. Failure to deport aliens who are convicted of criminal offenses puts whole communities at risk, especially immigrant communities in the very sanctuary jurisdictions that seek to protect the perpetrators. Countless Americans would be alive today and countless loved ones would not be grieving today if these policies of sanctuary cities were ended. All right, some big city Democratic mayors, they're vowing to fight the Trump administration. We continue with Laura Ingram. Joining us now also is conservative commentator Monica Crowley. Monica, I'll start with you. L.A., San Francisco, Chicago, New York. All right, they want to aid and abet criminal aliens. That's a crime. I, I spoke to a father today, Steve Ronnebeck. His 21-year-old son was killed in a convenience store by a criminal illegal immigrant that had previously raped and held and kidnapped a woman for an entire week, we didn't deport him, and then he ended up killing his son. 
One of the main reasons why Donald Trump was elected president was during the campaign, he was unafraid to speak very uncomfortable truths about illegal immigration and what he was going to do to enforce the law, enforce the border, protect the American people and our sovereignty. That's one of the main reasons why he's sitting in the Oval Office today, and he means it. There is uniform immigration law under the federal government in this country. The Supreme Court for over a century has held that the federal government has exclusive power to make and enforce immigration law there's in this no, country. There's no statutory that the, limitation. That is the only thing he is doing here. He's not doing anything outside the boundaries. And by the way, when President Obama was there, he had the federal government sue states like Arizona for wanting to enforce federal immigration law. It's Remember insane. that? It's and yet insane. now the federal government under President Trump is being is being resisted in uh, terms of trying Laura to in. make states and cities enforce yeah. the law. <clears throat> Laura, I, I mean, I look at this and I'm thinking, this is aiding and abetting crime. Right. If, if any of the three of us did this, at least in my case, I'd be handcuffed, perp walked, mug shotted, throw away the key, and you guys would have to visit me with a cake and a file. Yeah, I think I think about uh, the Rockville rape case. Really? These, 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 these thugs were allowed to go free at the border, allowed to go free, posting, oh, they were held for a week and then released to their, quote, sponsors. I mean, when this happens under any president's watch, under any Homeland Security secretary, this policy, when this occurs, the individuals responsible for this policy... I think they have blood on their hands. I really do. The, we have enough problems in the United States, enough crime committed by American citizens, even if it's down in some cities, I understand that, and that's good news. But in places like Baltimore, in places like Chicago, L.A., the poorest Americans, the working poor, who have already been dealt a, a difficult hand in m many circumstances. Now we go to them and say, you know, we know they're not all these jobs because a lot of those were shipped uh, overseas, but now we're going we're gonna to put the welcome mat out for all these illegal immigrants, many of them bringing in gang affiliations, uh, drugs and other problems. We're going to bring them in and we're going to just see how your life turns out because we feel like it's our noble duty to resist Donald Trump. So we just hope it works out for you and if you know, someone in your family dies, that's, I guess that's just the price we have to pay. Thank you both, as uh, always. We'll have you both back soon. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up today, President Trump signed an executive order relating to energy independence. I've been saying this for years. The EPA administrator, Scott Pruitt, will join us next exclusively to explain what's going on and also later tonight. Get ready to drink hella water because you're about to be hungover as <laughs> You're going to die. What about you? You're going to die. Yeah, part two of our series exposing spring break, your kids absolutely wasted and hammered and plastered. Ainsley Earhart is here with that dangerous report. The action I'm taking today will eliminate federal overreach, restore economic freedom, and allow our companies and our workers to thrive, compete, and succeed on a level playing field for the first time in a long time, fellas. It's been a long time. I am taking historic steps to lift the restrictions on American energy, to reverse government intrusion, and to cancel job-killing regulations. All right, that was President Trump speaking earlier today after keeping yet another campaign promise by signing a new energy independence executive order that will roll back the Obama administration's energy regulations. Here with Reaction, the Environmental Protection Agency Administrator, uh, Scott Pruitt is with us. You know, Hi, Sean. sir, I have been saying for years, we have all this natural gas and coal and oil underneath our feet and we are begging countries that hate us for our, our, our energy, the lifeblood of our economy. Explain what this executive order will do and what it means for America's goal towards energy independence. Sean, what a great day at the EPA today. The president, as you indicated, came to our agency and signed an executive order and how wonderful it was to see a collection of coal miners from across the country stand behind the president as he signed that executive order because it was a message across the country uh, that we're going to do exactly what you said, Sean. Uh, make sure that we are good stewards of the natural resources that we've been blessed with as a country, but actually harvest and use those natural resources to bless the American people. And so it's a great day to make sure that we send a very pro-growth, 
pro-environment message. And that's what started today with the president's executive order. All right. Let me, uh, you know, it's very interesting because if you listen to the left, especially Al Gore, now this is the same Al Gore, sir, that I, I caught on a, on a Gulfstream 3, which is one of the least uh, energy efficient models of private aircraft in the sky then he'd get off with only two people at seats 15 or 16 he got off the plane into his private limo so I guess he bought carbon offsets but he recently suggested the civil war in Syria and Brexit are caused by climate change how do you answer this insanity well, I mean, I think that's a key word, uh, Sean. There's been a lack of common sense, a lack of sanity with respect to how we've done regulation, regulations in this country for the last several years. And, you know, until this past administration, the Environmental Protection Agency worked with states across the country to advance an environmental agenda that was about clean air and clean water, but it also understood that we didn't need to be antagonistic to, to economic growth and jobs. You know, since 1980, Sean, we've seen a 65% reduction in pollutants across this country, air pollutants, while at the same time growing an economy. So it was this past administration that made us put on jerseys. It was this past administration that said, if you're pro-environment, you're anti-energy. If you're pro-energy, you're anti-environment. The president, the president is saying, we're going to reject that narrative. We're going to have a different path forward. We're going to be pro-growth and pro-jobs and pro-environment and get back to the core EPA originalism, if you will, Sean, uh, the core mission of the agency advancing air quality, advancing water quality, but doing so with the sensitivity you know, to creating jobs. Sir, many years ago, I was a contractor and I bought an old Providence Gas Company van. It was the best $200 I ever spent in my life. It did have some body damage, but I fixed that myself. I was able to do it. It was a vehicle that had run, this is back in the early 80s, that used to be run on natural gas. And it runs cleaner, as I understand it, than for example, gasoline, and we have more than, than the entire Middle East has oil combined, do you see America maybe moving towards natural gas-run vehicles? How much would the average American save and how many jobs would be created? I think I think that's happening. We're in the process of that technological revolution, if you will, Sean. You know, the, 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 what the president did today that I think was very key is, is he declared an end to the war on coal. He declared an end to the war on fossil fuels. He recognized that we've been blessed as a nation with natural gas, oil, coal, renewables, nuclear, and the rest. And we're going to make sure that we use all forms of energy to, to generate electricity so that we can grow our manufacturing base. But as you indicated, Sean, uh, giving consumers the option you know, with respect to fuel efficiency and choosing vehicles that are run on natural gas. But, but we need to have a focus, a renewed focus, you know, with hydraulic fracturing and, and horizontal drilling, at, at, at making sure we take advantage of natural gas, but also the well, coal industry and the rest. The last administration picked winners and losers. Yeah, you know, well, it's they said, did. It's and, said, it's, and how many millions of jobs will be created, do you think, if we go with this all the above strategy? Because energy is the lifeblood of any economy. We, how many years would it take America well, to become fully energy independent and how many jobs would be created if we keep c clean coal and natural gas and drilling and maybe even nuclear at some point and by the way new developments and, and new technologies that emerge as well. You know when you think about it Sean the announcement last week with the Keystone Pipeline you know so it, the, the, what's great about what the president did today is it's going to unleash the American spirit with respect to energy innovation uh, in the transportation network, in, in pro exploration and production. Can you guess how many millions of jobs might be created? You know, can you, I, you can't. I, you know, the manufacturing, you really can't because the manufacturing base is going to be reinvigorated. We're going to keep these jobs in this country. And, and again, the coal miners that were at the EPA today, as they heard the president speak, they were very emotional because their industry has been under assault for the last several years. And so for the first time in a long time, Sean, when you talk about yeah. optimism, there's optimism and hope that we're going to create jobs yeah. across all sectors of the economy because of what the president did today. Sir, uh, this is a big day. It's a good and day. And I bet it's people won't pay as much attention. This may be probably the single biggest jump start to the economy up to date that the president did. Uh, a huge win. And you'll come under fire, but don't worry. Uh, I'm sure the civil war in Syria and Brexit is not a result of climate change. Thank you for being with us. Thanks, Sean. All right, and up next tonight right here on Hannity. Bye. I got these just for making out with guys. Don't worry, Mom. Are you crying? No, I'm not crying. 
Up next, the dangers facing your kids, part two of our series on spring break. You won't believe what our cameras caught on tape in South Padre Island in Texas. Ainsley Earhart is back with us tonight with part two of our investigative series. Welcome back to Hannity. So last night we showed you part one of our exclusive look into what's really happening at college spring break as college students all across the country head to tropical destinations to let loose. Now last night we saw a lot of risky behavior. Tonight, well, we'll bring you part two, but be warned what you're about to see is shocking. You may want to tell the kids to go get some cookies. Three, two, one. I'm really sorry I got arrested last night. It's okay. What did you get arrested for? <laughs> Smoking that dope, bro. Ah! When did you start drinking today? 12 p.m. Get ready to drink hella water because you're about to be hung over as <laughs> you're gonna what about you? die. You're gonna die. We started drinking at like 7 in the morning. What's the craziest thing you've done since you've been here? Um, a lot of coke. Oh. <laughs> are there a lot, a lot of people doing coke or is it just mostly drinking? Um, a lot of people are drinking, doing anything we can find. Um, spring break, so... Molly? Is there any Molly? Yeah, there's everything you can think of. Yeah, am I gonna get arrested for this? Have fun. Get f***ed up. It's hard being an alcoholic 24-7, but I know you guys can do it. Boobling! Everyone here. They're insane. I'm never coming back. A lot of them even working. Like sex on the beach. A lot of molesting. A lot. <laughs> molesting. That's a thing. That's like a straight up thing. Some guys gave them to me because they thought they thought I was cute. My beats. My beats were free, but if you have beads and you're not me. You're a whore. Tell me why you have so many beats. Well, I flashed people. I just, just flashed. I haven't made out with any guys. I just flashed with <laughs> I made out with 14 people. Hey! <laughs> All right, joining us now is Fox and Friends co-host Ainsley Earhart. All right, they were talking about molesting, mm -hmm. sex, mm -hmm. on the beach, cocaine, marijuana, and to me, just my observation, everybody is plastered. I know. So more people are now going to South Padre Island, which is in Texas, and it's in the Gulf of Mexico. Did we chase them there from Panama City Probably, Beach? Probably, because they've yeah. seen an increase in the students going there. Now that they're not going to Panama Beach, they've got to find another place where anything goes, and anything goes here. You're allowed to even bring kegs on the beach there. You're not allowed to drink on the beach anymore in Panama City. So um, they're bringing kegs out on the beach. Four people died during Texas Week. Texas Week is the biggest week in the month of March. They call at Texas week because most of the universities have spring break that week. It's between uh, March 11th and March 18th. They had 100,000 people. Those are estimated numbers. There that weekend alone, and they made 30.5 million dollars. Four uh, four people have died. There's a shooting at Clayton's Beach Bar, which is one of the two places where the kids go on the beach. There's Rockstar Beach, and then there's Clayton's Beach Bar. They have concerts there, and um, that's where the shooting happened at Clayton's. They do Molly. They do cocaine. There are keg stands everywhere. You see them drinking alcohol off each other's bodies. How many bodies. of these kids end up in the hospital? I'm sure a lot. I don't have that number in front of me. Yeah, and you know, look, these are some are freshmen, some are sophomores. They're not 21, and all this is going on. The biggest thing, and we got into this a little bit last night, is people outside of the area, really bad people, they come in and their idea is to pray. You went into how, for example, nobody knows they're selling, quote, ecstasy. It's not ecstasy. They're selling Molly. It's not Molly. Right, they, right. They, we don't even know what's in these drugs. So that they buy. is, it's, that's twofold. Because they're, se we don't know what's in the drugs because they're synthetic. And it's not exactly the, the same makeup with every batch. 
Therefore, the officers last year were telling me uh, down in Panama City that what happens there is you can't arrest someone necessarily because it doesn't test as cocaine, it doesn't test positive as molly. They don't even know what's in these drugs. It's just a combination of stuff. So you're trusting these drug dealers to sell you stuff and you could die because no one knows what's in the drugs. So dangerous. Um, all right, great job as always. And we, you did get the laws changed in Panama City Beach. And Thank the you bar did. owners, the bar owners hate both of us. They don't like us, but the parents yeah, do. They do. And that's all that matters. We all want right, to keep, keep the kids safe. All right. And we have more Hannity as we continue. And yes, we'll get to your mean-spirited, hateful, and some nice comments on the Hannity Hotline straight ahead.